Okay, everybody. Um, the peculiar thing is that I can't hear any of you, but uh, apparently you can all hear me, you poor things. So I just wanted to start you off and introduce you to the very lovely Dr. Rob McCartney. Uh, Dr. Rob is an occupational and environmental medicine specialist with over 20 years experience in the field. Um, his particular areas of interest are the well-being of individuals, but also the minimization of organizational risk and the minimization of the impact of um, industrial processes on, on people and the environment. So a really sort of a well-rounded portfolio. This is a man who um, does extensive medical examination of work uh, in the aviation industry, but also the coal mining industry. So above the skies and well below the earth. So he's covering all bases. Um, he's also uh, chief medical officer for Woolworths. Hope that that gets him some cheap groceries. Um, if it doesn't, that's pretty disappointing. He clearly deserve them. This is a really amazing guy. And I know that you will find this talk very, very interesting. Now, can I just say a word to everybody? Um, the last time we had one of these talks, uh, somebody's spouse or partner walked into the room where you were um, watching on the screen and then they proceeded to undress. So if you can make sure that if your spouse walks in that they don't undress or if you quickly could mute your video so that no one else can see it because what it meant was our last talk we could not release as a as a video we could only release it as an audio so um, to protect the undressing person um, anyway take care sit back and enjoy the wonderful dr rob mccartney thank you Hello, thank you very much, Michelle. Now, Michelle can't hear me say thank you, but uh, I'll say thank you anyway, and um, thank you for the introduction. I'm now presuming everybody else can hear me, um, and if you can't, I can't ask you that you can't hear me, so I'm just going to start presenting. Um, and it's just a, a chat, really, about an interesting um, part of this, of work-related injuries, and the assessment thereof, all motor vehicle accidents, all personal injuries that happen in another environment. And um, these are called the, the flag system. And we've got a presentation that we might um, get up and running that can help direct me. Um, essentially, what we try to do, oh, and I was introduced as doing lots of medical legal. I do do a bit, um, but uh, uh, my original background was I built occupational medical centers so clinics that were specifically specialized in treating work-related injuries so every day across the century we might have 50 walk-in injuries and those injuries would then be managed by our doctors and we would uh, develop acute injury management rehabilitation return to work uh, etc. Um, the good news is, of course, most work-related injuries, well, first of all, most work-related injuries and motor vehicle injuries, they don't go and see a doctor at all. They just uh, manage it themselves or you get some first aid, get better, go back to work and it all goes away. Then there is a certain percentage uh, that uh, need to go and see a doctor and get treatment what we call a medical treatment injury. I'm hoping everybody can see the screen now. Um, I'm just going to talk and sometimes the slide's going to match what I'm saying and sometimes not, but let's have the discussion. So as I said, the good news is most people get back pain, neck pain, knee pain or leg pain, just manage it themselves. It goes away, they don't come and see us. And that's because of the human body has a wonderful self-healing mechanism until it doesn't. What makes someone want to see a doctor about an injury isn't straightforward. Sometimes it's about the severity of injury, another time it's not. But when you do see a doctor, uh, it doesn't always necessarily improve an outcome. It depends on that doctor's experience and training and the ability to diagnose and, and treat the injury well. The good news is most injuries we used to see in our clinic when they got uh, appropriate acute treatment and musculoskeletal we're talking about here, uh, they would get better quickly, rehabilitate quickly, get back to work, and it would all be solved. Clearly, that's not everybody, or Medico-Legal Assessment Group doesn't exist. 
Um, there are some people who don't get better. And when I train up my doctors and my clients who want to know how can we stop the injuries that, in their words, that go pear-shaped, that is things that just don't get better. Um, now, sometimes these are because of the severity of the injury right from the word go. And if someone has a catastrophic spinal injury or multiple traumatic injuries or amputations, clearly the severity of the injury means they're going to end up with permanent symptoms, impairment and disability. Those ones still need our uh, attention, of course, and will need these medical legal assessments. But by and large, they tend to be fairly straightforward. The impairment matches the disability. And I'm sure everyone on the, on the tele meeting knows the difference between those two. Um, other people are the most stoic people in the world you've ever met, and they end up with um, uh, horrible dis uh, impairments, um, 30, 40% impairment, and yet their disability is minimal because of some sort of protective mechanism they have it built into them. Sometimes these are self-employed and they don't have much choice. Footballers, for example, professional sports people tend to have, tend to have quite severe injuries and pain, but they don't, it doesn't equate to disability because the rewards to go past that obviously are sufficient. Other people seem to have very low levels of impairment rating, and chronic back pain might be that, where they don't actually attract an impairment rating. It's a diagnostic related estimates category one in the AMA guides, but can be completely disabled and never going back to work. The more we were working in these occupational clinics, the more we would accrue numbers of people who got stuck. That is their rehabilitation, recovery, return to work and return to normal life didn't follow the anticipated path that should correlate to the severity of the injury. And that's uh, sometimes because of various complicating factors. And what we then like to do is work out how can we predict that and do something about it. And that became essential when we treat acute work-related injuries because if we don't pick them up early enough, these things that impede the recovery of a person from their injury, they end up with protracted disability, which leads to its own psychosocial problems. And then they get caught up in the legal process, um, which sometimes doesn't help their long-term outcome. It was incumbent on us as the treating doctors to work out what the possible risk factors are, biopsychosocial risk factors, so that when we're treating this person with rotator cuff syndrome or chronic neck pain or discogenic back pain, we realise that it's not just about the diagnosis and the pathology. There are other factors that come into play. And that's what we're talking about today is what are those factors? And more importantly, how can we predict them? And then the most important thing of all is what can we do about them? Obviously, by the time someone gets to a medical, I mean, that's what I was asking before, what is everybody in this conference, what do they do? By the time someone gets to a medical legal assessment, dare I say, it might be a bit late to be looking at the flag systems. But if an insurer or an employer or a lawyer sends someone with a chronic illness or injury early enough, recognizing the flags and managing them can still be of use. If you see someone two years down the track who still hasn't returned to work and has got chronic back pain, having an understanding of the flag system is really useful and enlightening. It's, there's not a lot of evidence that's gonna make a lot of difference. But let's go through them and talk in a bit more detail. Um, clearly what we know from the evidence is the longer someone's off work, even taking into consideration the severity of the injury, the longer someone's off work, the worse their outcome. Returning to work as soon as possible after an injury on appropriate and safe duties is the best pathway of recovery. 
the, the imperative there is appropriate duties and safe duties. And that just doesn't mean physically safe, it means psychosocially safe. We're all hearing about psychological safety at the moment. And it's vital that if we're going to get someone back to work with their um, meniscal injury that needs surgery, and we want them to stay at work, we have to make sure that it's a physical and psychologically safe workplace. And I'm sure we've all seen in our assessments sometimes where there, people are going back to work more for a statistical reason than for the overall well-being of the individual. Um, the good news is if an employer really embraces the concept of appropriate rehabilitation, it's a win-win situation for everybody. Win for the insurer, win for the worker, win for the employer. Um, the challenge is getting that right. It's vital whenever we talk about a compensable injury, we understand the nature of biopsychosocial medicine. It was a long time ago, and it goes back to Descartes, when we realised there is no separate system in the body. There's not the mind and the body. We worked that out hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Unfortunately, some people still feel there's a difference between the two. There is not. They are inextricably related. And if someone asks me, oh, isn't that pain just in their mind? The answer is, well, of course it is, because all pain is interpreted in the brain. And all of us, when we have pain, are interpreting it in our brain. And it's all interrelated. To try and unravel them is an artificial construct. To try and separate them might help a legal process, but rarely helps the individual because we are biopsychosocial beings. And to just address the bio, like some of my, I'm an old orthopedic trained doc, by the way, some of my orthopedic colleagues we used to do back in the day was, oh, well, this is broken, I'll just fix it. If there are other psychosocial issues, we saw bad outcomes. And so it's important that we address those. My little, my little, uh, process at the moment is my business is called Result from the Latin root of resilient. And most of my work now is just partnering up with organizations to help them maximize the health, well-being, safety of their workforce. And the reason I call it Result is because although I'm just a buffer rugby playing, ex-rugby playing, orthopedic trained doc, the more I look at the evidence, the more it's about psych. If we want to improve the health and well-being of the population, we need to spend more and more time addressing the psychological issues and the psychosocial issues. Um, and that includes things that can complicate recovery. So we focus a lot on this to try and stop individuals from becoming long-term injury cases should an event happen. Now, as we know, most injuries that end up in the compensation system are not major traumatic injuries. While we see those, of course, and all of them in this meeting will have seen some terrible uh, injuries, of course, but we also may well have, have seen our fair share, and I can only say from my experience, having done quite a lot of these, an over-representation of things like lateral epicondalgia, rotator cuff tendinopathy, chronic discogenic neck pain, chronic lumbar back pain, uh, et cetera. Uh, and we get a bit stuck on those because that pathology that we're trying to treat uh, doesn't seem to match the outcome for the individual. And that's where the treating doc and even the acute assessing doc, the doc who's assessing the first stage, has to have a good look at these. In the first four weeks, the most important thing, of course, is to rule out the red flags and the orange flags. The red flags are the medical or biological factors. And that is every now and then, one of the things you just want to call a back strain is going to turn out to be an infectious discitis, or it's going to turn out to be a cancer in one of the thoracic, uh, lumbar vertebra. It's really important to remember that every now and then, that a back pain is a very serious condition and those red flags must be ruled out. It's also important to realize that the comorbidities can sometimes be a red flag. So if we've missed the person's di uncontrolled diabetes or rheumatoid arthritis, and we're trying to deal with their chronic 
shoulder pain or carpal tunnel syndrome or de Quervain's, uh, then they can be red flags that will go a long way down the path of rehabilitation and treatment before we realize, oh, we've missed something here. The other things we have to pick up on are the orange flags in that early period. The orange flags are mental health factors or comorbidities. And that can include the personality disorders. It's really important to pick up on those. If we've got someone who's got an acute stress response, uh, a is going on to develop post-traumatic disorder, um, or has a significant personality disorder, it's really important to pick that up early because if we don't manage that orange flag, mental health comorbidity, prognosis is difficult. Down the track in medico-legal assessment, it's vital to pick those up. They often don't add much to it in the, in, in the latter stages, except those of us who understand the biopsychosocial model will always recognize that a, a, an uncontrolled mental health condition is a severe impeding factor to a good recovery from back pain. And often I have to talk to my patients or injured workers and talk about if you've got diminished mood and anxiety and chronic back pain, we really struggle to get rid of one without getting rid of the other. The back pain, the chronic pain can lead to diminished mood and anxiety, but diminished mood and anxiety can lead to chronic back pain and it becomes a vicious cycle. And I'll often tell them, if we don't get your anxiety and mood disorder managed, we can't get rid of the back pain um, without zonking you out with really strong opioid medication, which will just create a bigger problem for you. And I think that's the orange flag system. What we're talking about today, though, is more the yellow flag, or sorry, the other flag system, the psychosocial flags. But it's important to remember, rule out the red flags and the orange flags, which are what we would call the medical or biological factors, before we start blaming the yellow flags. And I do recall, and this isn't because I'm a great doctor or the other people are particularly bad doctors, it was just, it's just an anecdote, seeing someone who had been getting treated for, I think, about eight weeks with back pain and uh, was off work and receiving treatments. Uh, and when I saw them, they got sent to me as a specialist doctor, perhaps just saying, what's going on here? I was apparently the first one to undress them and there was a big stonking pile of nidal abscess. And I said, is this your pain? And I touched and said, yeah, that's it. I said, right. Always remember the red flags and the orange flags. But let's get to what we're talking about, which is the, uh, the issue of the other flags, the psychosocial flags. And there's various colored ones there. We'll talk about what they are, um, but we're then going to have to talk about what's, how do we measure them and does it do us any good to measure them? And that's the last question, because when we did a trial in our workplace and we started measuring them, it didn't initially make any difference to the outcome, which begs the question, well, why are we measuring them? What we do know from the evidence is if the individual has any of these flags we're going to talk about, um, the yellow flags, the blue flags, um, uh, the, the black flags, etc. Um, if they have these flags, their risk of chronicity increases significantly. Um, and we know that for all of them. Um, but what do we do about them once we pick them up becomes a much more problematic uh, issue. When we look at, when I talk to workplaces about what's the best way to minimize an injury going bad, the two most important interactions are what the supervisor says to the injured worker, and that's probably the most important, and then what the first doctor says to the injured worker. Now, it's irrelevant if someone's done a fractured femur. That's just a straightforward orthopedic problem. But for the back pain, neck pain, shoulder pain, knee pain, de veins, carpal tunnel, lateral epicondalgia, media epicondalgia, et cetera, those first few interactions, both with the employer and the doctor, 
And I'll throw in there the insurer are vital. And because uh, it can lead to some of the flags we're going to talk about shortly. Socially and psychologically, if people are, are impaired, the likelihood of making a long-term recovery diminishes, as we've talked about. Obviously, the other stressors associated with this are the financial stressors that most insurers in most states, people do not end up getting the same payments they will get before the injury. Um, and the payments are often inconsistent uh, and can take some time. When I advise clients, I always talk to them about this as a, a problem with chronicity of injury recovery, is if the people feel disadvantaged, that leads to anger and that leads to uh, unnecessary complications and legal processes. This is just a slide to remind everyone here, the idea of prevention isn't just primary, that is, well, don't have them lifting heavy things in the first place. Uh, don't have them getting exposed unnecessarily to ergonomic hazards. But that's just the primary prevention. In medicine, secondary and tertiary is really important to decrease the long-term outcomes. And that's what we're dealing with here. I see acute injury management, the way we deal with it, um, uh, as a, 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 a subsection of tertiary and quaternary risk management. Let's get on to the flag system that was the topic of today. This is a method of us to identify aspects of our patient or our examinee, um, their problems and their social context and how this affects recovery and return to work. They're relatively new, they only go back to the late 90s. And when we did studies on these, these were some of the most important indicators for chronicity of pain and disability. And it's as we talked about, it's recognizing the biopsychosocial model. It's really interesting that it took this long for this to be uh, documented, I guess, and managed. Good doctors intuitively knew it and would address it, but it took a long time uh, for us to write these things down and cre create a system. Still part of the problem, of course, is what are we going to do about them? But we've already talked about the red flags and the orange flags. Uh, but let's talk about the yellow flags. And these are the ones we hear most about. And they're probably the most important. As an occupational physician, I have to look really carefully at the blue and black flags as well. It's a lot harder for doctors or lawyers down the track of a medical legal process to be thinking about these. But I think all experienced lawyers and medical legal doctors get it. They've all seen the injured and disgruntled worker. And a lot of the problems, and sometimes a lot of the time during your discussions with them, is spent focused on occupational and socio-occupational flags. But the clinical yellow flags are the ones we want to look at. We subdivide those into certain categories, but beliefs, their, their own self-appraisal and judgments are really important. And pain is that interesting phenomenon. And by interesting, I mean really difficult phenomenon. As we all know, it's very personal. Uh, it's a physical and emotional phenomenon. So to just look at someone and say, oh, they're just not very tolerant of pain is misunderstanding what pain is because the inability to tolerate it is the pain. It's a physical and psychological thing. Lots and lots of people would love to be able to measure it so that we compare person A to person B both involved in a, in a uh, nose to tail motor vehicle accident, both got a whiplash type force through their neck, 
both end up with a muscular ligamentous strain with no bony or disc injury, and one is still troubled by chronic pain that's disabling them six months later, and the other has pain in the neck but isn't disabling. To be able to measure that pain, might, people might think is useful, but of course, pain is not just about the nerves firing, it's how they're interpreted in the brain. And the person's belief about pain is therefore vital. Changing someone's long-held belief about pain, that is pain is always pathology, uh, means serious underlying pathology is really difficult, but it's important to recognize that, of course, in this, if they believe their injury is out of their control, likely to worsen and unmanageable, um, then they will have a poorer outcome. If they think that the treatments aren't working or they're expecting them not to work and they feel they need to passively wait for the treatment to work, that's also a, a, a serious psychosocial yellow flag. The emotional response and we've all seen these, and I've seen them with these. We used to look after uh, uh, meat works, and there was lots of carpal tunnel syndrome, occupational overuse, upper limb problems. Um, and often it was early on when they started doing the work because of the repetitive manual work, they'd get inflammation and swelling of the forearms, which would travel to the carpal tunnel, and they'd get carpal tunnel symptoms. But then after about five to six weeks of getting used to the work, the inflammation response would decrease and the carpal tunnel would go away. Um, the challenge was who stayed away from our surgical colleagues long enough for it to go away. And often it would be the first consult we could pick that by the amount of distress. Um, and that had to do with how much worry or anxiety, what other things were going on in their life and their fear of their role and their security of employment. Um, and often that led to uh, poor outcomes because they wanted acute intervention. Then there's the abnormal pain behaviours with coping strategy we talked about. Over-reliance on passive treatments is a really bad indicator. Unfortunately, in some of the states I work in, and I won't name them, I see cases where someone's seen the physiotherapist 70 times. And I'm asked the question, will further physiotherapy help? Now I... I had a physiotherapist in our multidisciplinary clinics. We do lots of work with physios and they do wonderful work. But it's fair to say after 70 sessions, it may not be the type of therapy the person's going to respond from, respond to. And part of that is the concept of passive treatments, where they'll say, oh, the massage relieves my pain and takes away a bit of the muscle tightness and I feel great, but only for a few days. And then if I don't get another session, I'm back to square one. That's a bad indicator because it, it, I'm not sure what we're waiting on. It may be an indicator someone needs that. If they need that treatment, I'll put that in inverted commas, then that's a lifelong treatment. So too reliant on passive treatments is a bad sign for a lot of our musculoskeletal problems. Um, and avoidance of activity to be pain-free or minimise the risk of re-injury is also in some circumstances, a bad sign. Now, one would say, well, surely sensible people want to avoid pain and re-injury. Well, we do, but the question is to what price and how risk averse are we? Because if we say, I don't want any pain, that is often an unrealistic expectation in low back pain or lateral epicondalgia, both of which it's not uncommon to go for 18 months. Um, if the expectation is I want to be pain-free, then the individual is going to get blocked in the rehabilitation. What I often talk to them about is, why don't we have you do this for the next two weeks and keep a measure of your pain? And then when they come back and see me in two weeks, if they can last that long, um, if they say, it was terrible, Doc, I've still got exactly the same pain, the same as what it was on before, it hasn't made any difference. But of course the answer is yes, but you've done all of this in this two weeks. You've played, gone for a walk, you've walked the dog, you've gone out with your kids in the backyard, you've gone back to work, you've done these light duties, and you've only got the same pain. So you've got all these wonderful improvements in your life and you've only got the same pain. That's a really 
important threshold to get past to show people that even with pain, you can live a great life. Because if we can get them past that and they can stop worrying about pain, as we've talked about, if we can get rid of the anxiety and the diminished mood, we can get them, the pain can start to diminish because of the complex nature of pain. The blue flags are important as well. These are the, we tend to talk about the, the occupational blue flags. I talk to my clients about this, explaining their role in how some injuries seem to go pear-shaped and protracted and how they can do stuff to stop this happening. And part of that is rewarding rehabilitation and the return to safe work. Treating things that may not be clearly work-related early on and don't try and fight battles all the time with insurers to say, oh, this didn't happen at work. Because if it's musculoskeletal and they do manual work, it's nearly always going to be accepted by most insurers in most states. The very low threshold of work-relatedness means it's nearly always going to get up. And people will argue with me, well, back pain is so common in the population and this person wasn't doing anything. Why did work cover accept it? And the answer is because it's a system of social security that isn't based necessarily on hard science. It's there to help the community um, gel in, a, in an effective manner. And we want individuals who have got health problems that may be work-related looked after so that we can maintain uh, their, their, uh, their and their family's well-being. Trying to fight battles over whether or not this back pain was caused by that lifting or this neck pain was caused by this is sometimes not only is it not going to be effective, but you're going to impact on a person's perception of you as an employer and create anger or anxiety or depression. And the number of people I see who are not mad, but sad, they're sad that the employer they've worked with for so long wants to vehemently fight their workers' compensation claim. And even if their work-related injury in condition, so their condition has nothing to do with work in the eyes of medicine and science, in their mind it does. And they're the people who say, I've been doing hard work for 20 years and now I've got back pain. Of course it was caused by those 20 years of hard work. No evidence for that at all, of course. The degenerative nature of uh, most uh, of discogenic pathology doesn't correlate to hard work. There's some studies that talk about vibration in the seated position, et cetera, but by and large, not a lot of evidence. In fact, if you stay physically fit through physical activity, gym work, physical work, you're more protected than damaged. But it doesn't matter if a person perceives that and we don't address that and the employer doesn't, then that is going to be a blue flag and you have to expect a worse outcome which means it defeated the purpose of what you were trying to do in the first place. The other stuff's a bit trickier, the black flags, because they predated the incident and can't be fixed because it's already, the injury has already happened in that environment. And that's about the concept that they feel their workplace is unsafe, that they're not appreciated, uh, that and the work is lousy and all that happens is you get given more work and more work as you go along. Um, black flags can also be conflict with insurers and when lawyers get involved. Now, for my legal colleagues on the call, that's not all lawyers, but I think we all are aware of some of the personal injury lawyers who don't necessarily help their client recover from the injury and get back to full functioning and rehabilitation. In some circumstances, there's a financial conflict of interest for someone to get better from an injury, get back to full work and have no future economic loss. I think it's a very small number of lawyers who worsen the problem, but they're definitely there. I think just like in medicine, there's some doctors who through mistreatment worsen medical outcomes. 
But by and large, most doctors do the right thing. By and large, most lawyers do the right thing. How our family interacts in the legal process is really important as well. So these are the flags that we know make a big difference to the outcomes for individuals. Unfortunately, a lot of these are just picked up by us down the track, many months or even years. And when we're asked, why do you think it got like this? We can be all very clever and say, well, have a look at this and these problems, etc." It's very easy to be the, you know, what we always say in medicine, to be the last doctor because you've got all of the hindsight benefit of all the other doctors to then be the person who comes up with the fancy solution. The challenge is, what do we do about them early on? It's really important, I think, for treating doctors, physiotherapists, et cetera, to be aware of these when they're first treating. And I think those of us who are doing as independent assessments or second opinions, um, and I often get a lot of referrals, um, uh, I get lots, what's this got to do with work? But I get lots of others saying where the referral in essence is, why isn't this going away? Why isn't this getting better? And if, I, if we get them early enough, we can do something about it. But way down the track, being smart and knowing about these psychosocial flags doesn't necessarily help. We need to know early on. And then it takes really good communication to deal with these. Um, and that's the challenge, particularly in acute healthcare. Where's the funding to deal with these? Often the only methodology because of primary healthcare being limited in its resources and time is to, uh, we can only see people for a short period of time and to sit down with them, discuss with them for an hour, what are all the issues going on around and within your back pain is really difficult to do. That's where a physiotherapist who often has more time with the patient is worth their weight in gold. And there are some physios who intuitively pick up on the yellow, blue and black flags and deal with them, with the patient and then with the referring doc and with the employer. Red and orange flags hopefully are picked up by the treating doctor, but occasionally the good physical therapist or occupational therapist will pick these up. Getting the yellow and blue flags, the black are a bit more difficult. They're just telling us this is going to take a long time, but the yellow and blue flags are really important because we do know if we intervene in those and provide some solutions for the patient in a holistic biopsychosocial way, we can alter the outcomes. What's not clear is how important each of those weightings are. The evidence isn't strong enough uh, to say, oh, it's definitely this that's the problem. My experience, and as you know, that's the lowest form of evidence, is asking some expert or specialist what they reckon. But my experience is, is that early on period and how we talk to them, how we help them understand why they're getting the pain and what's going on with their body. and help them negotiate and navigate compensable medicine and injury is really important. If you have the time in the acute phase to do the tailored approach, look at the support needs, work out when is adjustment to injury needed. It's really important to not fly into that too early. There are a lot of people who, if you start telling them, I want you to see a psychologist in the first few weeks or even months of a physical injury, it's sometimes a, a bad consult because they will then start to think, oh, hold on, are you saying you don't think I'm in pain? You want me to see a head shrink? You're saying it's all in my head. You reckon it's me, not the injury. And if we're going to introduce early adjustment to injury counselling, it has to be very carefully implemented, introduced, and discussed with the client or the patient what we're doing it for. And that means for the, for the you, you have to um, buy into that your patient can understand a lot of these complex matters of the biopsychosocial model. 
a lot of people think it's too complex. They won't get it. And we just need to tell them, oh, look, you, 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 your back is out or you've, your disc is out. And, of course, as we all know, in back pain, almost never is that the case. And almost never do we know what's causing the back pain anyway. Nikolai Bogdan showed that the insert and intra-user reliability diagnosis of the cause of back pain is appallingly low amongst doctors, physios, neurosurgeons and orthopaedic surgeons um, because it's not clear most of the time what's causing it. But that's okay to talk to patients and say, what we do know is your back is good, but your pain fibers are fine. The problem with that is that affects your mood. And the mood then makes the pain fibers fire more. I think we really need to talk to somebody about how to manage that pain by talking about how we can improve our mood while we've got the pain. I think that's the way I help people embrace adjustment injury counselling. I don't tell them because I think they've got a psychological problem or a psychiatric problem. It's vital we give people the light at the end of the tunnel, in my experience. I know some of the evidence is concerned, particularly amongst our pain physician colleagues, that uh, to be overly panglossian or Pollyanna-ish and tell them, you'll be right, most people pain goes away, they worry that that isn't telling them the truth because a lot of people's pain doesn't go away. And they're right, but also they're seeing a biased sample. And even when we look at the evidence, there's oh no, lots more people end up with chronic pain than we originally thought. That's still a biased sample because we're only seeing those who actually see a doctor in the first place. When I had my own dys dystogenic back pain from a, from a rugby trauma and I kept getting recurring pain, I think I saw my doctors and my physios about 15 times before I realised this isn't actually making any difference. So I don't see them anymore. That doesn't mean I haven't got ongoing pain. It just means I've realised it doesn't make a whole lot of difference whether I see a doctor or the physio anymore. I just do my exercises and move on with it. But I'm, that doesn't mean I'm tough, not at all. I'm a sook and I don't like pain at all. What it means is that I realise, fortunately, that although it may run a protracted course, the pain will go away. You know when we say that to some patients, it turns out to be a lie. But most of the time, it's the truth. And if we can't alter the outcome, you're much better off being optimistic because the optimism will improve their mood, decrease their anxiety, which we know is a good outcome from the pain. So reassuring people in these early stages. So in summary, what we know is most injuries in the workplace, musculoskeletal injuries, are not... Uh, major traumatic injuries. The vast majority of medico-legal assessments that I will do are often chronic musculoskeletal pain, but not major trauma. And that's neck pain, back pain, knee pain, shoulder pain, lateral epicondyle, the decor veins, etc. Occupational lipolimobus abuse syndromes. Good news is most people with those will be managed appropriately and get better. Those that don't, and we see a biased sample in the medico legal assessment arena, uh, many of those, the factors that we can predict that will cause poorer outcomes are the psychosocial yellow flags. It's vital that we as practitioners in this subsection of medicine and, and law recognize these, because if our ambition is to help our patient or our client, get the best possible recovery and future well-being, including workability, we can't ignore these psychosocial flags. We must understand them, record them, and put in place strategies to minimise them, to either remove the, the issue that's creating the flag or get them some assistance with regards to their psychosocial well-being. Well, that's the end of the presentation. If there are any questions, if you could go off mute, I guess, we'll just get rid of the presentation so I can see people. Or I don't know if we want to raise a hand. This is where Michelle would come into her own, but she can't hear us. Oh, she can. She can. Yes. <laughs> hey, I, fi I finally worked out what the technical difficulty was. And for the first time in my life, I can say it was my fault. 
it's never happened before, so it's been a big. That's the first time you've had to say something was your fault, Michelle. Yeah, I, I look. I knew I'd make a mistake one day, and it just turned out to be today. <laughs> I ended up hearing slightly over half of that, and it was awesome. You're a great presenter, and there was certainly a lot for all of us to think about. Um, and and I, I thought that that's just awesome. Uh, let's open up to questions. Obviously, in our clinics treating these injuries, we've been looking at this for a long time. We we started off doing trials where we would record. Uh, early on, when someone walked in with a musculoskeletal injury, we'd get them to fill in a questionnaire because we're trying to pick up on it early. The challenge, of course, is you start asking, you know, my truck driver mate, 45, he's hurt his back because he hit a pothole or because they didn't fix the suspension in his seat. And when we start treating his back, then I start asking him, now, how are things going at home? How's your marriage? You know, how's everything? You can see some of them don't necessarily like those questionnaires. Um, they don't mind if you ask them in subtle ways, such as, uh, how's work? Are they, do they treat you all right there? You can get a whole bunch of information by asking an open-ended question like that. Or is this impacting you at home? You know, often I see blokes with your problem. It seems that, you know, it can affect your relationship even. And then they can open up. But if you just give them a questionnaire, which is, of course, the really cheap, effective, cost-effective way of doing it, they don't like it necessarily, and it can have a uh, uh, can worsen the outcome. So I think be careful about how you screen for yellow and uh, other flags. But it's vital we get them. The challenge is how are you going to get them in an effective way? Actually, that's something I noticed when I was working in in legal firms that. To, to get the fullness of a person's potential claim, there was so much more than just the injury at foot and, and the surgical or other mechanical interventions to, to heal that injury. There was, as you say, the full range of, I can't mow the lawn anymore, I can't pick up my children anymore, I can't uh, engage in relationship with my partner anymore because my back or whatever and those are things they really don't want to talk about but but you are right because they add so much uh, flavor if you will and, and and enhance the potential of claims but also of the doctor's understanding of, of how the pain's impacting that's right engage in relationship with my partner you mean like talk about tax returns and stuff look exactly adult <laughs> themes mortgages <laughs> children <laughs> yeah that that really creepy adult stuff <laughs> Hey, look, everybody, that was really great. We had very good attendance today. Um, as usual, um, I will follow up with a little bit of a, a summary and we will release the audio recording to you within the week. So those of you who missed or, or those of you who watch it can watch it again and also share it with your colleagues. Um, we, again, thank you so much, Dr. McCartney, for making your time available to us. It's absolutely so valuable um, to all of us that you do that these resources are wonderful um no more questions from anybody if not i'll let the lovely doctor go about his business stay safe everybody out there that covid's still around stay safe absolutely thanks so much take care